Welcome to the fourth video in our series on encryption. We've looked at various methods of encryption and ways of implementing them. And through it all, we've seen the importance of random numbers. We'll talk in more detail about the concept of randomness, we'll talk about the pseudo-random number generators computers generally use, and we'll talk about ways of getting entropy to increase the quality of the random numbers we generate. Randomness refers to a lack of predictability in a sequence of numbers. In the first video, Alice and Bob rolled a d30 to get a random sequence of numbers. Assuming that the die is perfectly random, the number 7 is just as likely as the number 11. That wouldn't be the case with, for example, rolling two ordinary six-sided dice and adding them together. Even if we assume both dice are perfectly random, you are three times as likely to roll a 7 as you are an 11. The reason why is that there are three times as many combinations that will give you a 7. 6 and 1, 5 and 2, and 4 and 3. Whereas only 6 and 5 will give you 11. Since 7s will come up more often than 11s, this is not considered a good way of generating cryptographically secure random numbers as there's a degree of predictability. Now let's consider shuffling a deck of cards. If we consider a perfectly random shuffle, then the first card is just as likely to be the Ace of Spades as it is the Seven of Clubs. But what about the last card? If the first card is the Seven of Clubs, you know the Seven of Clubs will not be repeated in any of the remaining cards. And once you look at the first 51 cards, you know with certainty what the last card will be. Since no cards are repeated, it's the card you haven't seen. So random numbers must be free to repeat to be truly random, as long as they don't repeat in any regular or predictable pattern. Also, truly random numbers must be distributed normally. That means that any combination of numbers must be equally likely. Let's say you have a long string of base 10 digits. The number 4 should show up about 1 in every 10 times. But not too regularly so that we can predict exactly where it is. But if, over time, the number 4 doesn't show up 1 out of 10 times, that gives us a bit of predictability to this random sequence. The number 4 must be less likely than at least some of the others. If you think it through, that means the same must be true of groups of numbers. Take, for example, the number 47, a 4 followed by a 7. We should expect the number 47 to show up in our random sequence about once in a hundred digits. The number 473, once in a thousand, and the number 4739, once in ten thousand. Again, not regularly, but if they don't show up that often over time, then that sequence is less likely than other sequences or more likely if they show up more often, and this increases predictability. The gambler's fallacy comes from not understanding this nature of random numbers. Sometimes you might get a number showing up more often. A gambler would say that number is hot, implying that it will have a greater likelihood of showing up in the future. But with randomness, it's inevitable that you'll get these clusters. It's also inevitable that they won't last long. Or, the gambler might go the other way and see a number that hasn't shown up in a while and say that that number is due. The idea is that since random numbers show up every so often, then that number's more likely to show up soon. Proper random numbers do not have a memory. They don't know that a certain number hasn't shown up for a while and think it's about time it did. Random numbers shouldn't be compressible. In other words, there should be no mathematical way of describing the random number sequence other than the sequence itself. For example, this number can be described as repeat 01 32 times. But this number can't be described in any way that uses less information than is in the number itself. The number is 64 bits long, and so it should be impossible to describe the number using a description that is less than 64 bits long. We can absolutely say that the first number is less random than the second, even though with any decent random number generator, the two sequences are equally likely. It's the class of sequences that's important. Sequences that can be described in fewer bits are much less likely than sequences that can't be described any more efficiently than displaying the sequence itself. Even if, by some amazing stroke of luck, you got this perfectly predictable sequence, you could place no reliance on being able to do that again. The problem from the start has been that computers are not random. They are very accurate and very reliable calculating machines using deterministic math. So how do you get a computer to produce random numbers? 
The general case is to use an algorithm called a pseudo-random number generator, or PRNG, PRING. This refers to any algorithm capable of producing numbers that closely approximate random sequences. Since they're not actually random, but computed deterministically, the numbers it produces are considered to be pseudo-random. The way they work is, a computer programmer picks a number to use as a seed and feeds that into the PRING. The algorithm takes the number and produces an output, which is the first part of the random number sequence. That output is then used as the seed for the next part of the sequence, and so on. The first thing you'll notice from this is that the same seed will always generate the same sequence of random numbers. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it has many practical uses. The Windows version of FreeCell has always allowed you to select your game by typing in a number. The programmers did not go through and make a lot of games and associate them with these numbers, it's just the seed for the pring. But it does allow Bob to tell Alice, hey, try game number 417. It can be solved, but it's a real challenge. And when Alice types in 417, the pring comes up with the same sequence of cards that Bob did. It's also important in graphics programs when using pseudorandom numbers to generate things like clouds or snow. Usually the artist will be given a field for the seed, and they can even try a bunch of seeds until the clouds are just like they like them. After that, they can generate the exact same cloud pattern, even if they create a new file from scratch, just by typing in the same seed. However, in cryptography, this is not what you want, so selecting a good seed is important. We'll talk about this later when we cover entropy. Another potential issue with prings is periodicity. This is best described with a demonstration. Let's say we have a really poor pring, which just spits out digits from 0 through 9, one at a time. And again, each digit is used as the seed for the next one. Before too long, we'll get a 4. And before another not too long amount of time, we'll get another 4. Now think about this. Since 4 is the seed, and every seed produces the same sequences, the pring has looped around, and this sequence will go on repeating forever. So what we need to do, even if we're just wanting a small scale of random digits, is have a pring that gives us long sequences at one time. So instead of just giving us a digit, it may give us a 32-bit number. If we need a digit from 0 through 9, we can treat this number as an integer and mod it with 10. Mod refers to modulo division. This is when you divide your number evenly and take the remainder. So here, we're taking our huge random integer and modding it with 10, which gives us 9. That will give us a number from 0 through 9. If we need a number from 1 to 10, we just add 1. As another example, if we need a random card from a deck, we can get a number from 1 to 52. So we mod our number with 52 and add 1. Even these will have a periodicity, it'll just be much larger. It's important for the programmer to understand this, and to give it a new seed before the repeating pattern begins. Obviously, the quality of the pring is important to cryptography. You want a pring that is rated as cryptographically secure, and you also need to understand what its periodicity is. A bad pring can completely break encryption, even if everything else is done correctly. Bitcoin uses secure and trusted algorithms to keep its wallets and transactions secure. But in August of 2013, Jean-Pierre Roup discovered that there was a problem with the implementation of Java Secure Random Function on Android devices, which resulted in wallets generated by Bitcoin Android apps to be insecure. Using this knowledge, he was able to search through the blockchain and find a vulnerable wallet, and then, with the kind permission of the wallet's owner, he was able to prove that he was able to transfer money out of this wallet. It's important to understand what the problem is with this sort of hack. A wallet that was generated somewhere else, but copied over to an Android device, was fine. A wallet generated on a vulnerable version of Android was still vulnerable, even if it was copied over to a non-Android device and deleted on the Android device. Root didn't even need to use the Android device to hack the wallet, or break into any Android device. He just looked through the blockchain and found a vulnerable wallet. It had nothing to do with where the wallet was stored, but where the random numbers to make the wallet were generated. The only fix was to create a new wallet on a secure device and transfer the Bitcoin over to it. Google did fix the bug, but as an interim solution, they pointed out that cryptographically secure random numbers could be generated even with a vulnerable version of secure random, 
simply by seeding it with a number from dev slash random. That's a virtual device on Unix-based operating systems which provides the programmer with random bits based on the device's entropy. Which is the third thing we need to discuss. Remember that entropy is the amount of uncertainty. Entropy is different from randomness in that it isn't under the same constraints we were just talking about. Think of entropy as the fuel for a randomness engine. The idea of entropy is that we're taking things that may not be random per se, but that are uncertain enough that we can use it to make our random numbers less predictable and therefore more random. For example, the Linux implementation of dev slash random looks at things like the timing of keyboard presses and mouse movements, as well as disk access. Other sources might be things that aren't random, but hard to predict, like the number of milliseconds since midnight. Some systems are beginning to use microphones and webcams as sources of entropy, discarding most of the data and just looking at the least significant bits where environmental noise and noise caused by the sensors tends to overpower other video and audio data coming in. You may have installed software that asks you to move the mouse around or type at the keyboard until a progress bar finished. This software is collecting entropy for its random number generators. GNU Privacy Guard, an implementation of PGP, also uses the number of bytes of free memory and disk space. Some modern processors even have what are considered by some to be true random number generators. This works because the technology today allows us to make diodes and transistors that are so small that quantum effects can take place. A diode only lets electricity through one way, but if the processor tries to shove enough electrons down the wrong way, the diode is so small that some of them will jump across due to quantum tunneling effects. These are considered by physicists to be truly random events, so the numbers generated this way should be truly random as well. So far, there's no consensus on whether these can generate true random numbers and replace all existing prings, but it is agreed that they at least have a high degree of uncertainty and thus are an excellent source of entropy. The more entropy you have, the more uncertainty, but it's important to understand that at the end of all this entropy harvesting, you will not have random numbers. But you do have something you can use as an effective seed for a pring. And long before any pring reaches the limits of its periodicity, you'll have collected enough entropy for a new seed. So, in this video, we've covered random and pseudo-random numbers. We've talked about the concept of randomness and how pseudo-random number generators work. We've also discussed the concept of entropy and how important it is for generating the quality random numbers demanded by cryptographic applications. This concludes part one. In part two, we'll take a practical look at how security works on the World Wide Web and how you can check to see if a website you connect to is truly secure.